if you are canning at home, you are probably worried about botulism. Well, I know I am, and last year I posted a video in which I very boldly proclaimed that I have never used a water bath canner and a pressure canner and that I probably wouldn't. And after I posted that video and I got a lot of uh, interesting comments on it, I looked at my own preserves and cans and jars and wondered if they were safe to eat and how actually I would know if there was botulism in it. As a result, I dug a little bit deeper into the whole topic of botulism, what it exactly is, what it causes in the body, how prevalent it is in the US, and simple ways how you can avoid it, and also how to know whether you have in it and what to do if you might think you have it in your preserves. And that is what I'm going to share in this video today. And if you're new on my channel, my name is Anya. I love sharing our very simple homesteading journey. So unfortunately, I have to make a disclaimer here, and that is that I am not a professional and I'm not an expert. So I am encouraging you to do your own research, just like I have. I will be leaving the links for the official FDA, CDC, and USDA websites in the box below this video with all the safe canning guidelines, home practices, processing times and temperatures. And if in doubt, that is always the recommended way to do things. Now, I know that this topic is not necessarily a fun, fluffy topic. And I also want to make sure that I am getting the science as accurate as I can. And that is why I have made myself some notes just to make sure that I'm really um, sticking to points and there's a lot of numbers and facts in there that I just want to make sure I'm getting right. What exactly is botulism? It is a bacteria that lives in the soil in untreated water and if you are let's say preserving carrots you could from the soil transport the botulism bacteria into your cans and then it might grow in there. The official word is Clostridium botulinum bacterium can cause very severe symptoms and it can also lead to death. And the symptoms are pretty much, um, interestingly enough, um, botulism is kind of what you are getting from Botox. It is actually something that causes paralysis of the muscles in the body and it usually starts from the top down. You might lose um, your vision, it might get blurry, you might have double vision, and then you might have difficulty speaking and swallowing. And then once it moves down into your respiratory system, that is where it can really cause havoc because you can suffocate. It can also move into your um, digestive tract and cause diarrhea and stomach cramps and so forth. So it's nothing to scoff about and it's something that you want to take very seriously. I looked at how many cases of botulism we actually get in a year in the United States and the latest data I could find at the time of recording this video was from 2018. In 2018, there were actually only 18 reported cases of foodborne botulism. There's other forms of botulism. It looks as if no one actually died. And when you look at the report, which I will be linking next to a whole bunch of other links that you might find interesting here on this topic, when you look at the report, you will notice that all of these foods that made people sick had some sort of protein in it. It was meat, poultry, fish, beans, green beans, for example. And then interestingly enough, most of the cases of botulism in the United States are infant botulism, which can often be caused by um, babies eating honey. And that is why they recommend not feeding honey to little children. So now that we know that it is a very serious illness that can cause death, um, we also want to understand what exactly can make it grow because from there we can look at ways how to avoid it. And the conditions that can cause this bacterium to grow is a low or oxygen free environment. So if you have a jar with very little air in it, 
then you might actually create the conditions for the botulism bacteria to grow. Low acid content in your preserves, a low sugar content, a low salt content, a certain temperature range, so anything above five degrees Celsius, I'll be putting in here what that is in Fahrenheit and above 90-ish degrees or so Celsius, I'll also put right here what that is in Fahrenheit. And then high moisture. So if you have something very dry like a cracker, you're not gonna get botulism in it probably, but in something like a jam, there's a lot of water in it. So that is one of the conditions that can lead to the growth of botulism. So having said that, if you do the opposite, you can actually inhibit the growth of botulism. And I'm just gonna look at my cheat sheet here again. So anything with a lot of salt in it, for example, I have some sauerkraut back there that has a lot of salt in it. And even though it has a high moisture content and right now I have a fermentation cap on it. So um, there is a bit of an airlock, but because it is so high in salt, the bacterium can't grow in there. And then the same, if you have a jam and you put a lot of sugar in it, that does not make it easy for the botulism bacteria to grow. You can also use high acidic foods and most fruits. I'll be leaving a link to the pH of most of the foods and fruits and um, types of produce so that you can determine how high the pH might be. So anything that has a pH of 4.6 or lower, or sometimes it's 4.5. So most fruits are actually lower than that. So they're very acidic and that prevents the growth of botulism. And then obviously if you have uh, temperatures below five degrees Celsius, which is typically your refrigerator temperature. So once you have opened a jar of jam and we don't have a seal anymore, it goes in the refrigerator and there it inhibits the growth of botulism. And then dehydrated foods because then you don't have a high moisture content. I quickly want to show you three different types of popular containers used in home canning and talk about what to look for because now let's talk about how you can actually when you're looking at your shelf with all these preserves how you can tell whether you might have botulism in it or not the probably most popular ones in the united states is the mason jars with a band and a lid with a rubber seal so you put that on, you typically create a vacuum with heat. And then once the um, air cools down, the little bit of air that there is in there, it cools down, it creates a vacuum. And how do you know you have a vacuum? Well, this one, you will not be able to press in. And also if you're not storing it with a band, you should be able to lift your jar on the lid here and it shouldn't come apart. That means you still have a really good vacuum. And also if you have to work really hard to uh, open the lid. So that is the mason jar type of container. A little less popular in the United States, however more popular in Europe and specifically Germany where I'm from is the WEC jar. It is a little bit of a different system. What you have is you have a jar with just a regular rim here and then you have a lid and a rubber band so you put the rubber band around here you put the lid on just like so they also have these little convenient clamps so that you can use it for food storage for dry storage in your pantry but it works the same because you have the rubber here this is your rubber seal and how do you know whether you have a proper seal is if you lift it up here it should not come apart and it actually takes a little bit of force to pull this which breaks the vacuum and that is how you open a WEC jar or WEC, how Germans say WEC jar. And then we have the twist off. Um, oftentimes I like to reuse clean um, cans or jars from something else and this one has a twist off lid which is similar. It has a bit of um, 
uh, rubber here on the inside. I think it's rubber <laughs> and it takes a little bit of force to open it. You also should not be able to, um, sometimes there is a bit of a dome here and you should not be able to press that in. And when you open it, you hear a little plop and then it is open. One sure sign, even if you have a proper seal, is that you would see some bulging. Let's say there's a dome here, or there would be a dome here, and I think this one would just break the seal. Because when this botulism bacteria grows, it, the metabolic byproduct of the growth is a gas, and that is the toxin that actually makes you so sick and that expands the air so it would dome up. Or if you, let's say, had a canned food and that would also, um, there is a German word for what that actually is when the contents want to expand, but they can't. So three things here really, how you can tell that your food is safe to eat. Like I said, you inspect your seal. And then next is you check your time. And this is where I'm briefly going to talk about what happens to botulism. So it's not like you have some, like I do some preserves from 2015 and that bacterium sits in your jar and all of a sudden it decides, hmm, I'm just going to start to grow. That is not exactly how it happens. When the conditions are right for the botulism bacteria to grow, it will grow. And it has a certain life cycle. So there is much more literature about this and much more in-depth information. However, it is fairly safe to say that if you inspect your jams and they're looking good, you have a proper seal, there's no bulging, after six weeks, you can assume that the botulism bacteria would have grown if the conditions were right. If after six weeks you have a proper seal, no bulging, you can assume that your canned goods are still safe to eat. And I want to mention here that in the research for this video, I watched a German YouTuber. Her channel is called Steffi Kocht Ein. I will be linking her below. And she has a lot of information about canning, home canning, preserving, and botulism too. And she talks about how in the food industry, and I found this really interesting, how in the food industry, commercial food manufacturers deal with this issue. Let's say they have a faulty thermometer and they cannot guarantee that all the proper processing times and temperatures were observed and they have a whole batch of, let's say, canned beans that they're not so sure about. What they will do is they take that whole batch and apparently put it in a separate room and leave that batch there for probably just 28 days, not the whole six weeks. After that, they check visually for bulging. If there's no bulging, they take a few samples and do a microbiological testing for any bacteria or any other growth in there. And if they don't find anything, they take that whole batch and sell it. And that is how they deal with it. Apparently it is a fairly common practice that they do this waiting as well. And let's say you do have, because we're separating a little bit here, jams, acidic foods, fruits, and something that has protein in it because most fruits don't have any um, protein content to speak of. And let's say you talk about your canning soups and you're canning your green beans that has protein in it. One last thing you can do is simply heat your food up and boil it until it is all the way cooked through because the botulism toxin is not very heat stable, so it will be killed off. So if all the signs look good, you have no bulging, you have a proper seal, and then obviously you are just looking at your preserves and if there's no mold on it, no funny color, no clouding, no funny smell, then you can most likely assume that it is safe to eat. However, there is never a 100% guarantee. There's almost 
always only a minimized risk, but nobody can guarantee that you will never ever have any spores in your canned goods. And the spores itself won't make you sick because if you eat the spores and they get into your stomach, there is so much stomach acid in your stomach that the spores will be killed. And that is what we said, the low acid environment. Why am I going through all of this? And why am I not just water bath canning or pressure canning just like everybody else? Interestingly enough, only in this country, most other countries don't have these practices for jams and marmalades. And I can tell you why. First of all, it needs special equipment that I don't have the room for and that I don't want to make the room for. Secondly, it takes more time. If you look at all the processing times uh, for, for jams, it just adds extra time and I like to keep things simple. And because I have so much to do here on my urban homestead that I like to see how I can save some time. And then also it naturally decreases the nutritional value of your jams. Mostly your vitamins, your minerals will probably still be intact. And that is why I, for myself and for my family, have chosen to not use a water bath canner or a pressure canner. Now for home canning, I have a recipe right here and I have a jam down here. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.